Uh, hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Um, Hamid Al Shahid, you are an independent researcher, curator, and architectural historian. Your work focuses on modernism in Egypt and more generally the Arab world. In April 2011, you founded the online platform called Care Observer. It is a platform where different types of writer can contribute to give a better comprehension and analysis of Cairo's architecture and urbanism. In 2017, you worked as the project curator of the Modern Egypt project at the British Museum. And in 2021, you created the exhibition Cairo Model at the Center for Architecture in New York City. Uh, this uh, exhibition is about your impressive study on architecture in Cairo that we can read in your book entitled Cairo since 1900, an architectural guide published by AUC Press in 2020. In your book, you present a selection of 226 structures spread all over the big city of Cairo. You explore the different uh, areas and uh, you focus on specific uh, buildings for which you create a sort of uh, ID card, uh, and we can find the, the exact location and even the name of the architects. Uh, here we have an example of uh, the district of Garden City. Um, you know, I have conducted many interviews about art history in the Arab world, and you're actually the first uh, panelist I interview whose work is about architecture. So this is my first question to you. Why do you think documenting uh, the architecture of the city is also important? Well, it's, it's a big part of uh, any society's uh, identity. Um, an identity is, a, is an ongoing process. Uh, I, I'm afraid that the question of identity within the context of colonialism wow. has been mobilized to pigeonhole entire communities, sects, uh, countries, societies, uh, and freeze, sort of freeze frame them into a particular mode of representation. Um, and in often cases, um, a lot of the elites within those societies embrace those colonially constructed notions of identity. And I think architecture uh, as um, the output, the, the spatial, the, the making of space um, offers, a, I think, an interesting lens to look at this process, uh, but also often to find many holes that challenge it because such narratives are always very, you know, if you can summarize the identity of a society uh, in like a one-liner, then something is wrong there, <laughs> you know. And I think, I think, for example, if you look at the United uh, Arab Emirates, yeah. um, I, I was just thinking uh, the other day, you know, this notion of the white dijdesha as the male outfit and the black abaya as the female outfit, you know, what is the history of that? Because I think actually, if you just scratch a little bit deeper, you'll realize that it's actually pretty recent, uh, pretty recent construction, most likely by a foreign office somewhere yeah. in London. Um, so, you know, these kind of like, uh, um, short, snappy notions of identity. You know, when you dig a little bit deeper and you find that they actually are much more recent than we think. I think architecture offers a really useful lens for this. And architecture has been weaponized. I mean, there is a reason why uh, all the cities across the old uh, Middle East are facing a lot of destruction and demolition. And demolition. It's yeah. essentially the way I see it is the destruction of evidence. Um, and the same happens actually within the newer cities of the Gulf. Mecca, Mecca's destruction, there's more to it than, than the narrative that we've been told. Um, you know, across the Gulf, um, old settlements were destroyed completely and then reconstructed in a very disnified way uh, later on, probably with the help of British consultants. So this is a, a very real and ongoing colonial making and remaking and erasing of space. So architecture is really, uh, it's too complex. You can't really, I mean, unless you have a war scale sort of uh, destruction, um, it, it, you will find a lot of holes in these narratives by looking at the complexity of a, of a, of a, of a city's architecture. Yeah, so can you tell us a bit more about your uh, re research methodology? Well, it, 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 for, it, that, for, for that book. For the book, um, you know, it's, it's an ongoing process that never really has a clear beginning or an end. I mean, in many ways, 
this the book uh, or the work that led to the book started uh, in 2010 uh, when I started to do my research as a, as a doctoral student uh, at New York University. Um, at that time, I didn't think I would be producing this book uh, some years later, right? But, um, you know, it is this kind of accumulation of knowledge, uh, problems that you encounter, and uh, sort of solutions that one has to come up with to counter those problems uh, over the years that then lead to a product like this. Um, so the methodology is constantly shifting as the the, the terrain that we're working on is, is very much unstable. Uh, I always, I mean, I say in the introduction that Cairo is an unstable city. Unstable in the sense of, um, let's say the sense of stability that's been created in post-World War II Europe, where you can visit a European city in, you know, 1975 or 80, and then visit it again 30, 40 years later, and you might very likely will find the same shop in the same place. That kind of stability is also unnatural in the current economic system, but it's been created. Uh, the, the opposite side of this, the flip side of this, is the instability that's been created in other cities um, in contested regions, mostly because of resource issues or because of whatever other political issues are at play, the destabilization of those cities and therefore the societies and their sense of identity manifests through architecture. So it's a shift in terrain. That means there are no, uh, you know, uh, Bibliothèque Francaise kind of uh, equivalent at the same capacity of offering services to researchers. That means that dictatorship, which is, you know, imposed, supported, and uh, put into place often by Western powers until today, um, you know, creates uh, many firewalls for researchers, such as security uh, clearances, um, you know, or just simply uh, taking records offline or making them inaccessible. In other cases, they just simply disappear altogether. Um, so it is, so to, to think about research methodology in this region, whether we're, I think we're working in Beirut or in Cairo, uh, means being actively engaged in an unstable shift in terrain uh, that is very deeply implicated in very complex political networks and movements and trends that have interests of which the production of knowledge about those places is not one of them. Um, so that means realistically in the case of this project, um, you know, the typical archives that one would reach out to and write in about the architecture of a, of a city would be one state archives, Okay. Um, collections um, two would be um, you know private archives and collections three would be targeting specific actors uh, who may have had uh, any sort of participation in the process of making architecture or ideas around architecture and see what they have to say um, so it's, a, it's usually a variety of these sources I relied a lot on published sources in my work um, because unlike archives, which can be shut away uh, behind the steel door overnight, uh, magazines and newspapers, at least from the period that I was interested in really, which is specifically from the 1920s to the 1970s, that was initially what I was really interested in. Um, that period was also a period of, of high level um, and widespread um, mass circulation publication. So those magazines and publications are much more difficult to confine and, and put away behind the door uh, or make them inaccessible because people have them in their homes, they are sold on the street, they are and there is surprisingly a lot of information in those uh, types of publications. So that was a main uh, source or let's say one of the main aspects of my methodology in doing this work. But then also there are archives that I was able to manage uh, to, to tap into. Uh, so you talk about the period that you are uh, focusing on. Uh, your book cover almost 120 years of architectural uh, development. Uh, Cairo is a megalopole, right? Uh, How has the urban landscape uh, of the city developed since uh, 1900? Since 1900, a lot has happened. I mean, this is what I wanted to capture. Of course, the year 1900 is, is random. You know, one could have started this book at 1899 or whatever. It doesn't really matter. But, you know, when, uh, when thinking about different aspects of how to also circulate a, a new set of uh, ideas, uh, sometimes it's useful to use these kind of um, rounded numbers like 1900. I mean, there's, been, there's, a, there's almost like a, a genre of architectural books out there that start with the year 1900, even though, you know, in reality, you know, <laughs> imagine starting at 2020 as if it had nothing to do with 1919, right? Like that, I mean, 1920, um, oh, 
2019, uh, the year prior. So it, it, these are random kind of in a way benchmarks, but they are useful um, to sell those ideas to a public. So so therefore, 1900 was a convenient way to point a starting point. Um, how much has it changed? A lot. I mean. Uh, currently, I'm working on this timeline project, which will manifest in two different ways. Uh, I've already uh, put a version of it in this exhibition that you've mentioned that's currently in New York, the Cairo Modern Exhibition, and the timeline is from 1900 to, um, to 2000. Uh, in that case, the one that I'm currently developing um, as a website will be an ongoing thing. Uh, it also starts from 1900, but it goes to the present. Um, and what I'm noticing working on this, and for example, the one that, I, that I'm working on now looks specifically at the Arab world versus Latin America, uh, which actually has been really useful um, to think about both of those regions in relation to the more mainstream narrative, which is of course focused on Europe and North America. Um, so when I look at Cairo at this time, in this time frame, well, it's gone through um, several things that include uh, what has been called modernization project projects by the state. Um, a lot of presence of quite early on from 1905, 1906, uh, you get to see private development um, intervene in the sphere of city building. This is quite early, but it's an important precedent for what we see later on in the century. Um, or context, at least historical context for that. Um, we see, uh, you know, revolutions, anti-colonial revolutions that are squashed. Uh, we see uh, that then they produce sort of a, a kind of a bourgeois um, sensibility that manifested also in architecture and urbanism. Uh, we see colonial interventions in uh, colonial administrative inter interventions in terms of who gets to do what. So, for example, I always like to refer to the example of um, Max Herz Pasha, who was a Hungarian Jew, moved to Egypt at the end of the 19th century, becomes a Pasha, and is in charge of the institution to take care of historic monuments, primarily um, what were called at the time Arab, not Muslim, uh, which is very interesting to think about the identity, the weaponization of identities uh, in the renaming of these institutions and architectures. So what we often refer to now as Islamic architecture, uh, at the end of the 19th century was simply Arab architecture, um, without sort of uh, emphasizing the religiosity uh, of the makers or the, or the functions of those buildings. In any case, this Hungarian Jew who was in charge of this institution was kicked out of Egypt in 1914 by British administration, administrative um, uh, officials, um, and therefore had a, a dire impact on this institution. So actually the collapse of the management maintaining and documentation of historic Arab uh, slash Islamic monuments uh, was very much impacted by British administrative, uh, Brit British administrative uh, individuals kicking out this um, this individual. So these kinds of stories have an impact both in the preservation documentation and development of uh, of the city. All of those are always interlinked. I mean, Max Herz Pasha, for example, preserved and documented ancient monuments, but he also designed new ones. Uh, so there is always a relationship between those two things. Um, what else do we see? We see a coup d'etat that is backed by the United States of America, right in the middle of the same time that the United States of America was backing coups in everywhere from Iran to Nicaragua to uh, everywhere, you know, other places in Central America. This is, for example, when I was doing this timeline comparing Latin America and the um, and the Arab world. It's really interesting what happens in the early 50s, where in both regions, you know. Uh, thousands of miles apart, you see American back crew, American back crew, American back crew. Oh. And what that manifested into is also a set of architectural and urban um, practices uh, that were for decades thought of within Egypt as, um, uh, you know, the, the representation of a new revolutionary regime right in the middle of 2011, as people were protesting in Tahrir Square, you know, the information was classified that also the coup d'etat of 1952 in Egypt was American backed. Right in the middle of that noise, that piece of information came out and it didn't seem to be uh, of much importance. But that also means that all of that urban and architectural 
um, the consequences that happened in the 1950s by the Nasser regime can now be revisited and thought of in a different way. We see, I'm sorry, one more time to add another layer, 1970s political economic shifts uh, in the height of the Cold War, redirected towards the United States, the privatization of everything, uh, including the massive urban and artificial uh, project by the state in the previous two decades become now uh, privately owned and, and sold for very cheap. And that completely transforms the city. Imagine if everything in New York City was reshuffled, the ownership was reshuffled over the course of two decades. It becomes all public and then the state sells all of it uh, to completely new owners. You know, these are the kinds of trends and movements, all of which have connection to much larger political and economic um, interventions uh, that are often imperial. So the city changed a lot from 1900. Yeah. Uh, I think one of uh, the archives that you access to is, uh, so the magazine El Imara, whose first issue was published in 1900. Uh, 39 by the Egyptian architect Sayyid uh, Karim. Uh, mm -hmm. The work of this uh, architect marked a sort of pivotal, pivotal shift in the architectural culture in Cairo. Uh, you mm -hmm. wrote in your book that he believed in the notion that, I quote, modern design, design of our time is not a style, it is a solution to modern problems in modern times. Uh, mm -hmm. What were these uh, problems that modern Cairo was facing back, back then? Um, so when when Sayyid Karim um, published uh, those words in the first issue of the magazine, uh, there's two things happening. There's kind of a local situation and again, kind of a wider situation that he's responding to. He went to study in 1933 uh, in, in ETH Zurich, uh, the School of Architecture there. And uh, this is the same year Hitler rises to power, you know, already the Nazis are having their presence. So it wasn't the most, Europe wasn't a welcoming place for him. And it's still not a welcoming place for me today, uh, which is why I actually relate a lot to this character. So one of the encounters that he had there, where well, he had two interesting encounters that I think shaped his thinking. One is that um, even though he is relatively privileged, by the time he gets there in 1933 to study for a master's, the school is not convinced that an Egyptian student is able to, to study there. So they make him pay for an entire year of classes without giving him credit. So that's number one. That must be traumatizing. And of course, it created a kind of um, um, an energy in him that he wanted to prove, of course, I can do this. I mean, people, unfortunately, people are still trying to prove to white people that we can do this too. You know, like it's an ongoing struggle. Um, and so, um, so that gave him kind of momentum to to finish his master's, but also to stay on and do a PhD, uh, which he finishes in 1938. Um, that's, that's important. In that period, when he would travel to conferences, architectural conferences, uh, and would present using slides, um, uh, architectural projects that are taking place in Egypt. So he actually took it upon himself to represent Egypt in this arena. Um, he would sort of be met with this belief that such structures exist in Egypt. So, you know, same old, same old Orientalism, racism, bullshit. Um, so that's an important aspect of where sort of what shapes his outlook. The other is that Egypt itself is going through quite a lot of interesting transformations, uh, one of which is that private capital is really shaping uh, the urban landscape in new ways that hasn't been seen before. And given that Egypt was a multi-ethnic, multi, uh, you know, identitarian society, uh, unlike a lot of the European societies that he was encountering when he was in Europe, those are quite, you know, Egypt was quite a mixed place. That meant that everybody, every client, um, you know, a, 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 a cacophony of, of styles uh, or appearances of architecture uh, were coexisting in the same place. So that was kind of, he wasn't, I, I think he wasn't sure if that's a good thing or not. And I think in the beginning, he thought that this kind of inconsistency um, in, in both the appearances of buildings, but also the kinds of urban interventions that are happening, also the lack of state intervention, given that Egypt's economy was still controlled by British administrators. Um, uh, so that meant that, you know, things like public service were not necessarily provided unless a private company stepped in. I mean, again, nothing, that, the, these things should sound very familiar to us today. So in a way when, so the urban problems for him were, were about inconsistency, about the lack of certain services, about the 
um, for example, in, when World War II happened and finished, he wrote an interesting piece wishing, I mean, it was a polemical piece, uh, wishing, you know, what would have happened if Cairo was destroyed in World War II? Mm. And, and his answer was, was basically that just like what European architects are experiencing, they, they're having the opportunity to reimagine entire cities. Um, and Cairo doesn't have that chance. So all of the problems only accumulated slowly and slowly and slowly. So his argument in that piece was that uh, damage that can happen to a, a badly managed city over a long course of time is even worse than the immediate damage that can happen to a city in the, in the sort of the moment of war. Wow. Uh, yeah, so, so, so these are the kind of, this is kind of a, a sketch of, I think, a, a wide array of his uh, interests um, that also led him to, to start this magazine, which as far as we know, it is the first Arabic language architectural journal in the world. Uh, you said that uh, Egypt, uh, so obviously Cairo was a mixed place. Uh, Cairo is a historical city where the Islamic civilization developed for centuries and also a strong cosmopolitanism uh, is visible, uh, especially as of the 19th uh, century, 20th century. Um, you also, you uh, previously mentioned uh, the architect, so the Hungarian architect, uh, Marx Harris Bay. Uh, here, so we have the example of uh, uh, the mosque uh, in Rifai. Yeah, well, what's really interesting for me is why did, uh, so there is, okay, so there's two issues here. One um, is this notion, this understanding of modernity, which has been kind of a narrative that's been strung together by mostly Europeans since the 19th century, uh, that, you know, that modernity is something that is transferred. Um, and uh, up until the 1990s or early 2000s, it was quite common to simply point to European figures who have been to places like in the Orient and different varieties, or up until today, actually, if you think about the Gulf, yeah. considering that most of its architecture is done by American offices or British offices, you know, so those are often um, that transfer that's often used as a narrative, uh, as a narrative centered on the notion of a transfer of modernity. Okay, so that's problematic for many ways. So for example, uh, let's take the reverse example. So Saeed Karim goes to um, Switzerland to study and faces quite a lot of problems, um, um, institutional and personal. Um, and yet when we discuss a figure like him or anybody who's traveled abroad, including myself, I mean, I did my PhD in New York, right? Um, imagine if uh, I know what it's like to then be reduced and say, well, he wouldn't, if, he wouldn't be who he is or he wouldn't know what he knows if, he, if it wasn't for uh, being in that Western context. But I know my history and I now know uh, say Kareem's history. Those were not uh, moments in which, uh, you know, we're sort of in drinking the Kool-Aid of modernity and then spewing it once, once we go back home. That's not exactly how it works. Uh, so that's one thing to consider. Uh, and the same with these European architects who were immigrating to Egypt. These are immigrants. Um, and unfortunately, because of contemporary politics, when uh, the notion of the immigrant has been racialized. And I mean, just look at them, for example, what's how the discourse around uh, what's going on in Ukraine today is so different from what was going on in Syria or Yemen or whatever. Uh, this kind of uh, intentional use of the notion, these are not immigrants like those other people. You know, yeah. this is, it's happening right now still. Uh, that notion, that approach, that vision, which is racist white supremacist, has been projected back on these individuals in the 19th century who were literally leaving Hungary, Italy, and other places in search for work. Um, so they are immigrants. They dressed in local dress, not because they were always Orientalists, but because they were actually um, becoming part of the society that they've called home. When, Sa when Max Hirsch Pasha was kicked out by the British in 1914, within four years he died and his whole family fell apart because that was the only home he knew. Egypt was the only home he knew. Yeah. Um, you know, he went to Italy um, briefly where his wife was from and they didn't belong there and political issues and so on. And literally he died depressed and broke. Um, Egypt was his home. And these are immigrants who were coming to this place not to bring uh, a basket of modernity and dump it on this place, but actually to look for work and to try to make the best out of what they know and the, what the place has to offer. Uh, and I think this example that you chose here is quite interesting because this is a project that starts in the 19th century. 
uh, and the uh, the lead architect on the project changes three times. It uh, starts with an Egyptian in the 19th century who dies. The project runs out of money. Uh, it was commissioned by the mother of the Khediv, which is important. Uh, that's a point that I'd love to talk about, which is the role of women in, in, in um, architectural patronage in, in Egypt or in Cairo in particular. Um, and then it changes to, you know, both an Italian and a Hungarian, both of whom work in Egypt and have lived in Egypt and even have titles uh, that are Egyptian titles. Um, and you see this mix of um, identities, both the commissioner, the state, the architects, the various ones, the practitioners, the workmen, you know, all of these, um, this melange really comes together in the final form of the building. So it's really the an example in which it's difficult to pigeonhole uh, this entire complex structure built over such a long span of time, almost 50 years, and reduce it to, uh, let's say, the identity of one of its architects or one of those uh, people that were involved in it. And I think this is the kind of place that Cairo was at the time. 